Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this week's uh, virtual worship service of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. My name is Stephen Ratliff. I'm the pastor at Indian Trail and uh, we welcome you for joining us, uh, however you're joining us for this worship, virtual worship service. We are continuing our outdoor worship service uh, through the month of October and hope that if you're able you can join us for that. We have changed that worship time to 11 as the weather has gotten just a little bit cooler. Um, we are worshiping at 11 instead of earlier so please join us if you can but if you can't thank you for for continuing to worship with us through these YouTube videos. A couple of weeks ago we started a sermon series based on Jack Haberer's book God Views. Um, last week we talked about the confessionalist God view uh, those Christians who are dedicated to uh, discerning and proclaiming and preserving the truth of the faith. And today we're going to be talking about the devotionalist God view, the Christians uh, who experience God most fully and uh, feel more at home when they are expressing their faith in terms of devotion to God, connection to the holy, uh, deepening a relationship and a connection to, to God through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, um, that will be this week's sermon, series, uh, sermon in the series, and then we'll move on to other God views in the coming weeks. I want to uh, get started with a word for our young people today. Um, when, I was, um, when I was in elementary school, it was, I've asked my sons about this, and they said this didn't happen when they were in elementary school, so I don't know if it was just something in my generation or not, but it was not uncommon to uh, to pass love notes. If you kind of thought somebody was cute or you kind of liked somebody, you might pass them a love note and it might look something like this. I've, I've recreated one. Um, uh, it might look a little bit like this and I don't know if the whole thing fits on there, but uh, this one says, uh, Dear Amy. Amy was a little girl that I, I kind of liked in second or third grade. Uh, Dear Amy, I like you. Do you like me? check one yes or no love Stephen. now i don't remember for sure but i can pretty much guarantee you that when this came back um no was checked um but that's how we kind of told somebody that we liked them now today as i said just a minute ago we're going to be talking about devotion to god how it is we love God and express our love to God. Um, different people express their love for God in different ways. Um, and as individuals, our love for God, our feeling of love for God, um, sometimes is greater than others. Sometimes we feel it more and sometimes we feel it less. But here's the good news for us. I can promise you that if we were ever to write a letter like this to God, dear God, I love you. Do you love me? Check one. I can promise you that God will always check yes. God loves us. We are God's children, all of us. And God loves us no matter who we are and no matter what happens in our life. God's love for us does not change. Let's pray together. Dear God, we pray very simply. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love you as much as you love us and to love each other as you love all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, moving to our scripture reading, I should say, also, I meant to say during the, the, the greeting, um, I'm in a different place. I'm not in the pulpit today. I have this idea that as we talk about the different God views, um, that I will uh, record these worship services from somewhere that is kind of symbolic of that particular God view. And last week, we, when, we, when we talked about the confessionalist God view, proclaiming the truth of the, of the faith, 
um, I recorded that from the pulpit, uh, the the place of proclamation. That's not that that's not how everybody proclaims the truth, but it is symbolic of the proclamation of the truth of the faith. And this week, I'm sitting in a chair in my study um, where I often spend my prayer time, uh, where on many days I can be found at some point in the day um, sitting quietly with God, uh, praying in a, in a contemplative way with God. And so this place is symbolic of, of my experience of devotion to God. And I'm sure you have places like that uh, that are symbolic for you as well. So as we move to uh, the proclamation of the gospel today, um, I'm going to read, first of all, just a couple of verses from Psalm number 42. Uh, this is a, these are two verses that, that people often use to, to, to refer to our devotion to God, our longing for God. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As a deer longs for, for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? Listen to those words one more time. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? And then from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, we hear what might, what might be a familiar story to you about Jesus making a visit to the home of Martha. And it's a story about how Martha and her sister Mary respond in different ways to the presence of, of Jesus among them. Let us listen again for God's word. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Martha had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Holy God, may we now choose the better part. As we sit at your feet, speak to us, and by your Spirit, may we hear your word for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, um, I want to tell you a story about uh, David and Betsy. Uh, this was a young couple in a church I once served, and um, they were about my, my age, the age of me and my wife, and um, we, uh, they, like us, had only been married a, a couple, two or three years, and we were talking one day, and, and, and I found out that there was a, a particular source of friction within their relationship and within their marriage, and uh, the friction was around their spiritual lives. Um, you see, Betsy had grown up in a faith tradition that was very, uh, very expressive and demonstrative um, and, and very uh, emotional about their um, experience of God and, and their connection to Jesus. And in fact, in her home, she told the story that on most nights, her family would gather in the living room, stand in a circle and hold hands, and then they would all pray out loud in turn about their love for Jesus and their devotion to God and their personal connection uh, to Christ. Now, David, on the other hand, had grown up in a, a 
somewhat different faith tradition and household. And I think it's fair to say that in his tradition, um, the experience of the faith, the experience of God was, was a little more in the mind than it was in the heart. Not that the heart wasn't involved, not that, the, not that there was no feeling, but, but it was more of a thinking faith, um, a, a mind faith than it was a heart faith, I think it's fair to say. And um, his prayer was mostly, you know, quiet in his head. And, 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 and Betsy was concerned because it, to her it seemed that he did not have a strong connection to God. He did not have a strong uh, personal relationship with Christ. And so I tried to help them understand that, that, that they came from different traditions and that, that both of those traditions were legitimate. Um, and that different people of faith express their connection to God in, in different ways. You see, just like in our individual lives and in our individual relationships, we differ in our emotional experience and expressions toward one another. Um, you, you know what I mean? I mean, some people are just kind of warm and fuzzy, and, and, and other people are more detached, a little more coolly detached. I mean, we might all have people in our families that we have no doubt love us, but they're not always expressive about it. Um, and so in the same way, disciples differ in, in their emotional um, experience and expression towards God. Um, so we are talking about the devotionless God view, a, a, a God view in which the people of faith who feel most at home in this particular God view uh, are folks who who really desire that that deep connection, emotional connection to God, um, a, a true experience of the divine. Devotionalists want to grow closer to God. They want to know God, and they want other folks to know God as well. The, um, the, uh, the person in my past that was most clearly a devotionless Christian, uh, to my mind, was a woman named Josephine. Josephine just, um, she just, she just had a heart for God. I mean, she was absolutely in love with Jesus. And, and she was so expressive uh, of her emotions, of her personal connection to God in Christ. Uh, it, was, it was evident in her worship. It was evident in her prayers. It was evident every time she talked about her faith uh, that she was, she was just so, felt so personally connected to God. Now, not all devotionalists have that that outward, uh, overt um, uh, expression of their of their faith. Uh, some are, are are not quite as expressive of it, but it's there nonetheless. Um, many of you members of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church will obviously remember Fred, our 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 dear brother in the faith, who died about a year ago, and Fred was not, you know, outwardly gushing emotionally about his faith, uh, but he was very open about the fact that he felt a personal connection to God. I remember one particular Bible study, we were talking about prayer, and, and I made the comment that, you know, some Christians have a really hard time with prayer. We, we don't always know what to pray, or we don't know how to feel connected to God in prayer, and, and, and I remember Fred just kind of shaking his head and and saying, I just don't understand that. He said, me and God, we just talk. I mean, we just talk all the time. And he said, well, I'm riding down the highway in the, in the truck that I drive, and, 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 and me and God are just talking. Fred obviously was a devotionalist. He obvious, obviously felt a, a, a clear personal connection to God. Uh, devotionalists also don't have to come from, um, from those traditions of the faith that, that talk about uh, uh, Jesus in, in personal relationship terms, uh, because many devotionists are what we call contemplatives. Um, they are folks who may not talk a lot at all about faith, but who spend a lot of spiritual energy, a lot of their time seeking a deeper level of relationship, uh, connection to the divine, to God. Um, they might, uh, some confessionalists might spend two or three times a day, 15, 30 minutes, maybe an hour at a time, just sitting quietly with God, maybe just reading passages of scripture, maybe uh, contemplating or meditating on those passages of scripture, simply seeking that deeper connection 
to God. Some con uh, contemplatives might spend hours and hours at a time doing this. We think a lot of times when we think of these types of Christians, we think of uh, the monastic tradition, uh, people who sort of uh, disconnect themselves from everyday life in a, in a community where they can, can devote hours and hours uh, growing in their deeper connection to God. These are different expressions of the devotionalist God view. Um, people for whom knowing God more intimately is, is a powerful driver in their faith. Now, sometimes other Christians will get a little bit um, critical of devotionalists. Um, one of the common criticisms of devotionalism is uh, particularly from, for those folks who are, are so outwardly emotionally expressive of their faith, one of the more common uh, criticisms is the sentimentality or the mushiness that, you, that some people, the way some people express it about devotionalism that goes along with that. Um, Tom Long, a very well-known and, and, and wonderful Presbyterian preacher, pastor, uh, and preaching professor, has told the story about... Um, how he got called to task for being too dismissive of the sentimentality of a particular aspect of devotionalism. He was leading a workshop, and I think it was a workshop on worship, and at some point he sort of made a dismissive, tongue-in-cheek comment about the, the old hymn of the church in the garden. You remember that hymn? Um, um, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. And, and Tom Long, I guess for him personally, that that uh, particular hymn felt a little mushy and, and syrupy. And, and he just didn't, it didn't personally speak to him. And he kind of made a dismissive comment about it. Um, maybe as a joke, who knows. But at the end of that session, one of the participants in the workshop came up to him. And I think he said, if I remember correctly, with tears in her eyes, she said to him, Sir, please do not be so dismissive of that hymn in my presence again. She said, I was deeply abused as a child um, on multiple occasions, and the only way I got through it was to go out into our backyard in the flower garden, and I'd walk through that flower garden, and I would sing that hymn to myself. He walked with me. He talked with me. He tells me I am his own. And so Tom Long got it. He realized that this was a powerful experience of a personal, deep connection to God. A very legitimate, um, faithful experience. Devotionalism is, a, is an important aspect of the faith of Christianity. Um, we are all called into a deeper connection to God. Now, there are some um, potential pitfalls, just like we talked about some of the dilemmas that went along with confessionalism last week. There are some pitfalls to devotionalism if we get too caught up in this one aspect of the faith. Uh, Jack Haber, in his book, points out some of these, some of these pitfalls. He says, for example, that um, uh, devotionalism sometimes disengages the mind. You know, we are called to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, the thinking part of the faith is very important as well. And so Haber warns that sometimes if we get too caught up in the, in the emotional connection to God, we might neglect the, the mind aspect, the thinking aspect of the faith. He also mentions another pitfall as, um, the fact that devotionalism can disengage the will. He quotes the, um, the cliche that says, they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. In other words, he warns against getting so caught up in our devotion and connection to God on a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a personal way that we forget the, the work of the faith, the service of the faith, um, the proclamation of the gospel, the reaching out to those who are hungry and those who are lonely and those who are in need. Um, and then thirdly, he says, another pitfall to devotionalism is that it can lead us to, um, to too much of an individualistic experience of God so that it kind of comes, becomes all about me and Jesus, just me and Jesus. And, and we forget about the rest of the family of faith, 
um, the rest of God's children. In fact, Haber says, and I like the way he puts this, um, it is a personal relationship with God to which we are called, but it's not just personal. It is interpersonal. We are all together called into relationship with God, which means we are in relationship with each other. So those are some uh, sort of warnings, some pitfalls of, of devotionalism as a, an expression of our faith. But having even having heard those and acknowledged those, we cannot forget, we cannot forget that story from Luke's gospel, the story of Martha and Mary. Um, we are called to, to, like Martha, to be of service. We are called to be at work as the body of Christ, to be, um, as some have said, the hands and the feet of Christ in this world. But we cannot forget Jesus' words to Martha um, when she complained about Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet, soaking in his words, being connected to him, growing in her relationship with him. Do not forget, Martha, that Mary has chosen the better part. Let us never forget the call to be connected to God by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Let us never forget our devotion to the one who is so wholly devoted to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we turn to God in prayer, I want to, um, the pastoral prayer this uh, this week, I've taken uh, for my inspiration the words of that hymn that I referred to in the sermon, In the Garden. Um, it is, it's not a hymn that I have sung a whole lot in my faith experience in the churches that I've been a part of. And, um, and I guess I'm a little bit like Tom Long. Maybe I thought it was a little bit too syrupy, too individualistic. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, if you pay attention to the words of that hymn, the third verse is very, uh, is very enlightening because the third verse actually reminds us that we're not to stay in the garden. Uh, we spend our time in the garden only to be sent out of the garden. Um, as the line says, through the voice of woe, in other words, through the voice of those in need around us. God is calling to us. And so let us pray together. Holy God, we do come to the garden and very often alone. For some of us, it is early in the morning when the dew is still on the roses. For others of us, it is at other times of the day, but we come to the garden to be connected to you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ's Holy Spirit, as we linger in the garden, your voice is disclosed to us. You speak to us. As the hymn says, you walk with us and you talk with us and you tell us that we belong to you. We are your own. And when we hear these words in the gardens of our prayer, our joy is indescribable. But as this same hymn reminds us, Holy God, we are not called to stay in the garden alone with you. The garden is the place of our nourishment, the place of our calling, the place of our spiritual nurture. And like the and like the disciple in that third verse, we would like to stay in the garden with you, though the night around us is falling. We would like to stay in the garden with you always. But you bid us go. 
because through the voice of woe, your voice is calling us. Through the voice of those in need, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are hurting, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are hungry, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are oppressed and living with injustice, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are lonely and afraid, your voice calls us. From the, through the voice of those who are, who are drunk on their own power and in need of repentance, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are selfish and sinful and need the call to repentance, your voice calls us. Through the voice of those who are broken and penitent, and in need of forgiveness, your voice calls us. And so thank you, holy God, for the gardens of our prayer. And thank you also that you don't let us stay there. But you send us out with the good news that you love us and your answer to us is always yes. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, go out. Um, spend your time in your garden, but go out to love and serve in the name of Christ. Never forgetting as we get, as we, as we, um, as we fulfill our Martha roles, never forgetting our Mary roles. Um, the call to be connected by the power of Christ's Holy Spirit to the divine, the holy, the holy one, the God of all creation. Never neglecting our, our call to be to grow in our, in our love for God, in our connection to the divine. And now may that divine God, the one who has created us and who saves us in Jesus Christ, and who goes with us by the power of the Holy Spirit, may that God never leave us and always answer our, our love letters with resounding yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.